In the inaugural year of the Ten Thousand Races War, an unfathomable number of demons descended upon Earth, transforming the planet into a sprawling battlefield encompassing a myriad of races. Despite humanity boasting a fraction of awakened individuals with extraordinary abilities, their numerical inferiority and lack of sufficient combat prowess swiftly placed them at a disadvantage. Resorting to the utilization of firearms and nuclear armaments, humanity scrambled to erect ten defensive lines in a desperate bid to stave off the relentless assaults of the Ten Thousand Clans. Over the span of a decade, two of humanity's defensive bulwarks succumbed to the unyielding onslaught, plunging the fate of the human race into ever more precarious depths. Faced with an increasingly dire situation, humanity found itself compelled to wage a relentless battle against the inexorable tide of the Ten Thousand Races. The toll exacted by this protracted conflict is staggering, with the Eastern Human Alliance alone tallying over a million military casualties since the war's inception. As ammunition dwindles and the ranks of supernaturally endowed individuals swell, the landscape of warfare undergoes a profound evolution, presenting humanity with both new challenges and unforeseen opportunities for survival and triumph. As nations recognize the indispensable role of these gifted individuals on the battlefield, a strategic shift towards their enlistment became paramount in the quest to reclaim territories and ensure the survival of humanity. To this end, the imperative to expand the scale of these legions and commit wholeheartedly to war became increasingly apparent. Thus, in the tenth year of the Ten Thousand Races conflict, the country of Hua embarked on the largest scale conscription effort in its storied history. This monumental undertaking commenced in the industrial hub of the Northern Frontier, a pivotal city within the Eastern Alliance. Amidst this backdrop, the narrative transitions to a solemn ceremony unfolding in the northern frontier, presided over by a venerable mayor. Behind the mayor, poignant images of fallen heroes from the war serve as a poignant reminder of the sacrifices made. With fervor and conviction, the veteran mayor addresses a gathering of students, extolling the valor and selflessness of those commemorated individuals who stood as pillars of strength for both Yi City and the nation of Hua. With the recent loss of the Ninth Defense Line, the mayor underscores the precariousness of their situation, warning that should the Ten Thousand Clans breach their defenses anew, Yi City will undoubtedly bear the brunt of the ensuing devastation. In a solemn address, the veteran mayor announces the Eastern Alliance's imminent mobilization of a million individuals endowed with supernatural abilities for a decisive counterattack against the Ten Thousand Races. Turning to the assembled students, the mayor poses a crucial question. What role should the younger generation of E-City assume in this critical juncture? Stirred by patriotic fervor, the students resoundingly declare their commitment to defend their homeland, its majestic landscapes, and its cherished heritage. Eager to join the ranks on the front line, they clamor to enlist, embodying an unwavering resolve to confront the enemy head-on. Amidst this fervent atmosphere, attention turns to Nan Ziying, the protagonist of our narrative. As Nan Ziying's information is read aloud, detailing their age, lack of awakened supernatural ability, and current pursuit of architectural studies at UE City Industrial University. The instructor queries Nan Ziying's decision regarding enlistment. To the surprise of many, Nan Ziying opts not to join the frontline combat forces, instead choosing to contribute to the war effort through logistical support. This unexpected decision underscores the diverse roles and responsibilities essential for the success of any military campaign. The revelation of Nan Ziying's decision sends shockwaves through the gathered students, prompting inquiries from classmates curious about Nan Ziying's reluctance to join the frontline ranks. Some express surprise, suggesting that roles in logistics are typically assigned to those deemed less fit for direct combat, such as women, children, and the elderly. Amidst murmurs of disapproval, classmates label Nan Ziying's choice as an act of cowardice. They point out Nan Ziying's robust health and outstanding academic achievements emphasizing the urgent need for more personnel on the front lines during this pivotal moment in the nation's history. Reminding Nan Ziying of the collective shame felt when the Ten Thousand Races breached the defenses, classmates appeal to Nan Ziying's sense of duty and honor. Despite the impassioned pleas from peers urging Nan Ziying to reconsider, the resolve remains steadfast. As tensions escalate, the veteran mayor intervenes, urging the students to maintain composure. Emphasizing that enlistment is voluntary and driven by personal conviction and a sense of duty, the mayor encourages respect for individual choices and service to the greater cause. The veteran mayor's address underscores the voluntary nature of enlistment, allowing students to make their own choices. Upon noticing Nan Ziying's academic excellence, the mayor expresses regret at the potential waste of talent, 
urging Nan Ziying to depart. As Nan Ziying leaves amidst disparaging remarks from peers, the scene transitions to the following day, where the assembled forces prepare for departure amidst a flurry of activity. Helicopters hover overhead, while ground troops board trucks amidst resounding cheers for their impending victory on the front lines. Meanwhile, Nan Ziying reads news reports detailing the Eastern Alliance's monumental counterattack against the 10,000 clans. However, the spotlight shifts dramatically as Nan Ziying's name trends as a rookie who refused frontline deployment, sparking widespread condemnation. Despite the efficient functioning of the logistics department, public sentiment casts Nan Ziying as a coward for their decision. The discourse surrounding the decision to remain behind underscores a prevailing sentiment that young individuals shirking frontline duties are evading their generational responsibilities. Amidst the inundation of critical commentary, Nan Ziying reflects on the dichotomy between heroism and peril inherent in the impending conflict. While acknowledging the valor of those poised for frontline deployment, Nan Ziying perceives the gathering of a million troops as an optimistic yet potentially misguided endeavor underestimating the formidable might of the alien forces. Drawing from personal experience in a previous life, Nan Ziying recalls a journey from early enlistment to frontline combat and eventual ascension to the rank of war commander, where strategic acumen was honed. Faced with humanity's inexorable retreat, Nan Ziying's dedication shifted towards the mastery of five major talents, culminating in the implantation of corresponding talent trees within. The envisioned synergy of these talents held the promise of reversing the tide of war, yet the abruptness of humanity's defeat truncated Nan Ziying's efforts before fruition. Nan Ziying's demise at the hands of one of the 10,000 race's most formidable adversaries leaves him grievously wounded grappling with regret over the untimely realization of his potential. Reflecting on the pivotal role his talents could have played in safeguarding humanity, Nan Ziying ponders whether fate or an unrelenting obsession drove his rebirth. Remarkably, upon reincarnation, Nan Ziying finds that the five talent trees implanted within him have been preserved intact. These talents form the cornerstone of his renewed purpose. The first, the beast-taming talent tree, grants Nan Ziying the ability to tame and command multiple beasts simultaneously, augmenting their abilities and exerting control over mutant creatures. The elemental talent tree, the second in his arsenal, endows Nan Ziying with mastery over forbidden elemental spells, including those of water, fire, phoenix, lightning, and beyond. The potency of these spells escalates with the expenditure of greater elemental energy. The third, the Azura talent tree, offers a path to unparalleled ferocity with each kill fueling a berserk amplification. Through ultimate focus, one can transcend into an Azura, capable of decimating legions of enemies with ease. Nan Ziying's arsenal of talents extends further with the inclusion of the Formation Talent Tree, a mastery over diverse formations with limitless stacking capabilities, promising the release of boundless power. Completing the Quintet is the Undead Talent Tree, endowed with the ability to summon undead entities whose strength correlates directly with the expenditure of resources. Despite the daunting prospect of upgrading these talents, requiring significant reserves of source stones and time, Nan Ziying approaches the task with unwavering enthusiasm. With the conviction that maximizing these five talents and devising strategies spanning vast distances will render Nan Ziying an indomitable force, even amidst the collapse of all defense lines or facing the 10,000 races alone. The belief in safeguarding humanity remains steadfast. However, Nan Ziying acknowledges the current limitations. Venturing to the battlefield would yield few victories against the alien races and hamper the accumulation of the necessary source stones for talent upgrades, potentially stunting Nan Ziying's skill development prematurely. Nan Ziying perceives the quickest means to amass a substantial quantity of source stones lies within the treacherous terrain of the trail grounds. Teeming with a multitude of mutant beasts, these grounds present an opportune environment for gathering the resources necessary to advance his talents. Recognizing the urgency of this endeavor, Nan Ziying resolves to hasten his acquisition of source stones for talent upgrades. Upon arrival at the rear trail grounds of a city branch, elders and women now toil alongside one another, lamenting the absence of youths who have departed for the front line, leaving the training grounds deserted. Their efforts focus on converting mutant beasts into provisions for the soldiers stationed at the front lines. Amidst this environment, Nan Ziying witnesses the exchange between Xiao Lu and Andy Wan, expressing concern for each other's well-being amidst the shortage of manpower and Xiao Lu's injury. Offering his assistance in handling the mutant monsters, Nan Ziying acknowledges the shortage of staff plaguing the trail grounds. 
Xiaolu expresses enthusiasm at Nan Ziying's offer of assistance, alleviating their concerns about the shortage of staff. Leading Nan Ziying to the changing room, Any Wang observes the arrival of a young man at an unusual time, initially puzzled by his presence. However, upon recognizing Nan Ziying from recent news reports detailing his refusal to join the front line, Andy Wang's realization dots. Inside the training grounds, Xiaolu acquaints Nan Ziying with the alloy sword designated for combating mutant beasts, cautioning him about their ferocity. Expressing gratitude for the warning, Nan Ziying assures Xiaolu of his vigilance. As Nan Ziying enters the training grounds, Xiaolu reflects on the newfound opportunity to expedite progress. Despite Nan Ziying's reserved demeanor, Xiaolu muses on his striking appearance. Andy Wong playfully admonishes Xiaolu's daydreaming emphasizing that Nan Ziying's handsomeness holds no bearing on their current tasks. Xiao Lu is taken aback upon learning of Nan Ziying's perceived cowardice, prompting Annie Wong to voice skepticism regarding Nan Ziying's capability to confront mutant beasts given his reluctance to join the front lines. Anticipating Nan Ziying's eventual discontent and desire to withdraw, Anti Wong harbors doubts about his resolve. As Nan Ziying steps into the training ground, a notification prompts him to embark on a level A trail, with no prior trail records found. Nan Ziying confirms his readiness to commence the challenge. With the initiation of the Level A trail, the door opens, unleashing a horde of mutants. A subsequent notification warns of an impending dark night with no retreat for humanity, posing the question of whether Nan Ziying is prepared to become a shadow in the night, enduring countless curses for the sake of humanity's future. After a deep breath, Nan Ziying affirms his willingness. Facing the advancing monsters, Nan Ziying resolves to employ his beast-taming talent as the starting point of his trial. Nan Ziying reflects on the aftermath of the 10,000 races invasion, noting the proliferation of mutated animals imbued with spiritual energy. Recalling experiences from his past life on the front line, Nan Ziying encountered not only the 10,000 races but also formidable mutant beasts like the Umbrella Bird. Armed with knowledge of its weakness, the vulnerable spot behind its head, Nan Ziying swiftly dispatches the bird with a precise strike before extracting a source stone from its remains. Reflecting on the talent upgrade mechanism akin to his previous life, Nan Ziying surmises that each kill yields a source stone, facilitating talent enhancement. With each upgrade, Nan Ziying gains the capacity to tame additional mutant beasts. Though sustaining minor injuries from the encounter, Nan Ziying remains resolute in his ability to endure such wounds. Strategizing to avoid vital points during combat, Nan Ziying maintains confidence in his capacity to prevail. Navigating through the swarm of mutant monsters with efficiency, Nan Ziying systematically dispatches each umbrella bird that converges upon him. As he observes an increase in both his effectiveness and the number of mutants he can tame, Nan Ziying's confidence grows. However, his focus is abruptly diverted as he identifies the leader among the umbrella birds. Assessing his physical condition, Nan Ziying recognizes the challenge posed by confronting the formidable creature head-on. Opting for a strategic retreat from the bird's attack range, Nan Ziying acknowledges the necessity of avoiding direct confrontation. Seizing a fleeting opportunity, Nan Ziying targets the bird's weak point, only to find it resilient against his assault. Retreating once more, Nan Ziying contemplates the enhanced durability displayed by the umbrella bird, which surpasses his recollection from his previous life. This realization prompts Nan Ziying to reassess his approach to the encounter. Undeterred by the challenges, Nan Ziying persists in his efforts to strike at the Umbrella Bird once more. Meanwhile, outside the gates of the training grounds, Andy Wong and Andy Lee engage in conversation while Xiao Lu queries their absence from the cafeteria during break time. Andy Lee expresses concern that Nan Ziying may attempt to abscond, citing the dire situation at the front lines where you city's proximity to the conflict mirrors that of the front line. Andy Wong agrees, emphasizing the need to prevent Nan Ziying from causing any disruptions, noting her readiness to intervene if necessary. Xiao Lu remarks on the perceived similarity in difficulty between the level trail and the front line. Their discussion is interrupted by an announcement declaring Nan Ziying's completion of the first floor of the A level trail. Surprised by the revelation, Andy Wong assumes Nan Ziying may have attempted to flee, only to be astonished when Nan Ziying emerges from the trail room bearing injuries but having achieved a new record for clearing the first floor. Andy Wong, visibly surprised by Nan Ziying's appearance, inquires how he ended up in such a state. Nan Ziying confirms that he has indeed passed the first trial, prompting Andy Wong's astonishment. Before leaving, 
Nan Ziying informs them that the bodies of the demons can now be processed. Xiao Lu, upon hearing this, turns around to witness a multitude of demon beast carcasses. Meanwhile, Nan Ziying, while taking a shower, reflects on the progress made, deeming it just barely adequate as the experience required for leveling up has significantly increased. With the ability to now tame up to 2,000 beasts, Nan Ziying realizes that achieving Beast Tamer Level 3 solely on the first floor of the Trail Tower may not suffice. As an announcement regarding the impending offensive round by the Human Alliance echoes through the airwaves, Nan Ziying learns of the arrival of Level 7 Super Ability Holder, Son of Thunder Punishment, and Level 6 Super Ability Holder, Flame Giant, at the front line. Reflecting on his past life, Nan Ziying recalls the unfortunate fate of the Son of Thunder Punishment and the Flame Giant, whose eventual defeat on the battlefield exacerbated frontline losses. With the 8th defense line teetering on the brink of collapse, Nan Ziying senses the urgency to expedite his preparations, recognizing the race against time that ensues. Determined to forego rest, Nan Ziying resolves to ascend to the second floor of the trial tower without delay. At the entry point of the trail gate, Annie Wong expresses surprise at Nan Ziying's successful passage through the trial, though she anticipates he will require an extensive period of rest given his injuries. Annie Lee acknowledges Nan Ziying's dedication, highlighting the rarity of passing a level trial and commending his efforts. Andy Wong cautions against overly ambitious endeavors, advocating for gradual progression. Concerned about Nan Ziying's recovery time, she wonders how many days he will need to recuperate from such severe injuries. Andy Lee is taken aback upon seeing Nan Ziying's condition. Addressing him, Andy Wong questions Nan Ziying's decision to proceed to the second floor after completing the tasks on the first floor. Nan Ziying explains his intention to continue the trial on the second floor. Concerned, Andy Wong questions the purpose behind Nan Ziying's actions, expressing disbelief that he would undertake such a challenge with severe injuries. Xiao Lu advises Nan Ziying to postpone his ascent to the second floor citing the presence of formidable mutant beasts. Xiao Lu offers to find assistance for Nan Ziying, a suggestion echoed by Andy Wong, who highlights the formidable nature of the ox-tiger beast on the second floor. Expressing gratitude, Nan Ziying insists on proceeding alone. Undeterred, he ascends to the second floor. Observing Nan Ziying's determination, Andy Wong questions why, if Nan Ziying is truly capable, he doesn't opt to join the front line instead. In the midst of the situation, Xiao Lu contemplates Nan Ziying's apparent lack of fear towards death, surmising that he may not be one to shy away from danger by remaining in the rear. Inside the second floor of the trial tower, a multitude of beasts converge before Nan Ziying. As he prepares to engage, Nan Ziying acknowledges the heightened intensity of the second floor compared to the first. With a swift strike, Nan Ziying manages to dispatch several beasts, yet he is caught off guard as one strikes him from behind, sending him tumbling across the floor. Despite the setback, Nan Ziying quickly regains his footing, recognizing his disadvantage in size and strength. Conscious of his injuries, Nan Ziying understands the importance of avoiding direct confrontations. As the beasts converge upon him once more, Nan Ziying adeptly evades their attacks and retaliates by leaping onto one of the beasts, swiftly dispatching it with a well-aimed strike to the head. As the remaining beasts begin to regroup, Nan Ziying devises a strategy. Recognizing that level 2 mutant beasts fall within the range of creatures he can tame, Nan Ziying resolves to tame them first before confronting them directly. Utilizing his beast taming talent, known as Awaken, Nan Ziying conjures a large red mana circle beneath the mutant beasts, causing them to collapse to the ground. Satisfied with his success in subduing the beasts, Nan Ziying contemplates the next step in his progression. Determined to advance swiftly, he sets his sights on achieving level 3 in one continuous effort. The scene transitions to three days later at the rear trail grounds of Yisidi's branch, where workers are bustling about, transporting the meat of the mutant beasts. With no available space remaining, a worker declares an end to the day's efforts. Meanwhile, Nan Ziying sits in a corner, having achieved level 6 in his ability to tame beasts. Reflecting on his progress, Nan Ziying notes that within just three days, he has vanquished over 10,000 beasts, a significantly more efficient endeavor than his experiences on the front line. With his beast taming talent now at level 6, Nan Ziying contemplates venturing into the wilderness, an environment where even level 5 ability holders struggle to navigate safely. Despite the rarity of direct attacks on the city by beasts due to the presence of super ability holders and firearms, Nan Ziying views taming these creatures as pivotal to his strategy against the 10,000 races. 
An elderly man approaches Nan Ziying, inquiring about the possibility of workers working overtime to transport another batch of supplies, emphasizing his willingness to contribute to the frontline efforts by working overtime whenever necessary. Nan Ziying politely declines the offer from the old man, stating that he needs to leave early today. Observing Nan Ziying's departure, Annie Wong remarks that Nan Ziying seems to be giving up after just a few days. In response, another worker defends Nan Ziying, acknowledging the significant progress made in the trail tower thanks to his efforts. Despite Annie Wong's dismissive attitude, the worker insists that Nan Ziying is performing admirably. Shalu approaches Nan Ziying and informs him that the workers have managed to catch up with the backlog in the trail tower. Advising Nan Ziying to take a well-deserved break due to his recent hard work, Shalu expresses gratitude for Nan Ziying's efforts. Nan Ziying appreciates the sentiment but mentions that he has somewhere to be. Upon hearing this, Xiaolu encourages Nan Ziying to rest and assures him that he won't be detained any longer. As the scene shifts outside to the campsite of the Eastern Human Alliance, trucks return from the front line carrying wounded individuals. Observing the influx of wounded individuals requiring medical attention in Yu City at the 5th defense line, Nan Ziying discerns that the situation at the front line is dire. Sensing the imminent collapse of the defense line, Nan Ziying wastes no time and prepares to venture into the wilderness. Meanwhile, the trucks of the Alliance forces come to a halt in the wilderness, where a soldier assesses that the brakes require repairs, necessitating some time. Yellow-haired women decides to leave the truck overnight due to the presence of mutant wolves nearby, prioritizing safety. As the soldier prepares to retrieve his gear and return to the truck, yellow-haired girl spots a figure running towards the wilderness. Concerned, she questions who would venture outside the city at this hour. Then we see that, it's Nan Ziying. Yellow-haired girl warns Nan Ziying to be cautious, cautioning him about the presence of dangerous mutant giant wolves ahead. As the scenario unfolds, the black-haired girl informs the yellow-haired girl about the director's repeated calls, emphasizing the urgency of delivering medicines to the swamp city hospital, inundated with wounded from the front lines. Despite the pressing need, the yellow-haired girl expresses reservations about traversing the wilderness safely, especially as someone is seen venturing alone into its depths. The black-haired girl highlights the perilous nature of the area, citing it as a den of mutant giant wolves. She stresses the vulnerability of the medical herb collection team in the face of such threats. Concerned by the unfolding events, the yellow-haired girl prepares to return to the track. Suddenly, a cry for help pierces the air, prompting her to glance outside and witness soldiers under attack. As they prepare to retaliate, a mutant wolf emerges from the front of the car. Swiftly taking action, the black-haired girl steps forward, neutralizing the threat with her firearm. The sound of gunfire echoes, heightening the tension of the situation. As Nan Ziying registers the distant sound of commotion emanating from the direction of the medical herb collection team, he pivots to realize the dire situation unfolding. Not only are the mutant wolves launching an assault on the medical herb collection team, but a separate pack is also ambushing Nan Ziying's position. Nan Ziying acknowledges this unexpected turn of events, recognizing it as potentially advantageous, given the heightened intelligence of the beasts due to the increased concentration of spiritual energy. Meanwhile, he finds himself completely encircled by the mutant wolves. Switching back to the herb collection team, the black-haired girl, sensing the imminent danger, cautions Xiao Nan the yellow-haired girl, to exercise caution. Whether they choose to eliminate or repel the mutant wolves, the black-haired girl advises seizing the opportunity to resume driving. Xiaonan confidently asserts her capability to handle the situation. Returning to Nan Ziying's perspective, he swiftly dispatches several mutant wolves with a single decisive strike. As the dust settles, Nan Ziying ponders the whereabouts of the alpha wolf, contemplating its potential significance in the unfolding confrontation. Contemplating the pivotal moment at hand, Nan Ziying realizes that by neutralizing the wolf pack, he could potentially save the besieged medical team. As the tension mounts, the imposing figure of the mutant wolf king emerges at the forefront of the pack. Reacting swiftly, Nan Ziying activates his beast taming talent, Awaken, causing all the mutant wolves to submit to his command. With the wolf king looming behind them, Nan Ziying vaults over the assembled wolves and directs his taming spell towards the formidable leader. In a remarkable turn of events, the once aggressive wolves begin to exhibit signs of submission, lowering their heads in deference. Meanwhile, at the herb collection team's location, the black-haired girl opens fire, signaling Xiao Nan to prepare for their escape through the now docile wolves. However, to Xiao Nan's astonishment, 
The vehicle fails to start, leaving them stranded amidst the encroaching pack. Amidst the growing sense of despair, the black-haired girl resigns to their fate, anticipating an imminent attack from the wolves. The girl with black hair was completely puzzled. She couldn't figure out what was happening. She began to doubt her own eyesight. Why were those mutant wolves looking kinda cute? It just didn't make sense to her. As the wolves, previously intent on attacking, retreat back into the wilderness, leaving the herb collection team unharmed. Perplexed by the sudden turn of events, both the black-haired girl and Xiao Nan struggle to comprehend the scene unfolding before them. In the wilderness, Nan Ziying stands atop a rock, surrounded by the assembled pack of mutant wolves, including the formidable Wolf King. As Xiao Nan and the black-haired girl arrive atop their vehicle, Xiao Nan's realization dawns. The once aggressive mutant giant wolves have been tamed. The black-haired girl, astonished by the sight, marvels at the singular feat of a lone individual taming such a vast number of wolves, questioning the level of expertise required for such a remarkable achievement. Meanwhile, Nan Ziying, seated calmly on a nearby rock, reflects on his newfound companions. Having successfully tamed a staggering 1,000 steel giant wolves, Nan Ziying ascends to the esteemed level 7 of beast taming proficiency. Surprised by the unexpected development, Nan Ziying notes the remarkable obedience displayed by the now-tamed wolves. With a sense of authority, Nan Ziying commands the wolves to disperse temporarily, to be summoned at his behest when needed. Addressing the wolf king directly, Nan Ziying imparts a crucial instruction to refrain from attacking humans, thus establishing a mutual understanding between man and beast. Considering the broader strategic implications, Nan Ziying acknowledges the existence of three additional uninhabited regions near Yi City, with countless more dispersed across distant territories. Recognizing the necessity of taming and subduing all mutant beasts within these areas, Nan Ziying contemplates the monumental task ahead. As part of his ambitious battle plan, Nan Ziying envisions assembling an army comprising over 10 million mutant beasts, a formidable force crucial for humanity's defense against the encroaching threat. Moreover, Nan Ziying emphasizes the importance of securing the path for the medical herb collection team, recognizing their role in sustaining the frontline efforts. Amidst these deliberations, Nan Ziying receives an urgent message summoning him to an emergency meeting at the factory. Intrigued by the sudden development, Nan Ziying ponders the nature of the situation awaiting him at the factory, preparing to address any unforeseen challenges that may arise. The focus shifts to the trail grounds at E-City Branch, where a senior officer arrives to address the veteran major. Expressing disappointment, the officer remarks that the performance of Yi City Branch has been subpar. Initially expecting rapid progress to alleviate pressure from the front line, the officer laments that even with slightly higher level mutant beasts, Yi City Branch seems to struggle. In response, the veteran major explains that dealing with mutant beasts of level 4 and above is a new challenge for Yi City compounded by the influx of elderly citizens from the rear who currently occupy the city's factory. Adjusting to handle these advanced threats may require additional time. However, the officer emphasizes the urgency of the situation, highlighting the frontline troops near starvation and the dwindling stockpile of mutant beasts in the rear to support military needs. It's clear they must swiftly address the challenge posed by these higher-level mutant beasts. Upon hearing this, the veteran major assures the superior officer that they will increase the deployment of personnel from Yi City to tackle this daunting challenge. However, the superior officer remains critical, expressing frustration that he had observed the entire Yi City branch for half a day without finding anyone useful. In response, Shaolu defends their efforts, explaining that the mutant beasts, nearing level 4, already surpass Yi City's current capacity. Nevertheless, the superior officer insists that Yi City is impeding progress, citing the first deserter originating from their ranks. He further accuses the people of Yi City of irresponsibility, unable to shoulder significant responsibilities. Annie Wong, incensed by these accusations, voices her discontent, recounting the sacrifices her family made for the country. She vehemently defends the dedication of Yi City's workers, highlighting their relentless efforts to maintain the supply schedule under challenging circumstances. Outraged by the officer's disregard for the efforts of the people, Andy Wong condemns his careless remark, questioning how he could devalue their hard work with a single statement. As tension rises, a bodyguard of the superior officer moves to attack, but before any harm is done, Nan Ziying swiftly intervenes, incapacitating the assailant with a single decisive strike. The sudden appearance of Nan Ziying elicits relief and joy among the onlookers. 
Even the veteran mayor is taken aback by Nan Ying's presence, pondering whether Nan Ying has awakened his latent talents, considering his remarkable feat of defeating a level 5 ability holder with such ease. However, the superior officer, perturbed by Nan Ying's interference and apparent disrespect, demands to know his identity. Upon seeing the officer, Nan Ying recognizes him as Lin Yukai, the notorious profiteer known as the blood leech of the supply line. In Nan Ying's previous life, Lin Yukai was infamous for trafficking various military supplies from the rear to the front line, profiting from the ongoing war. Amidst the unfolding confrontation, Nan Ying reflects on Lin Yutsai's notorious past, recalling how he had caused significant losses before being exposed. Nan Ying surmises that Lin Yukai likely targeted Yu City's processing capabilities, intending to exploit the operation to profit further while neglecting the city's responsibilities. It comes as no surprise to Nan Ying that Lin Yukai is involved, realizing that he must address this issue. However, Nan Ying decides to first deplete Lin Jotsai's resources before confronting him directly. Asserting the workers' innocence, Nan Ying emphasizes that they are not rebels seeking trouble, nor are they as irresponsible as Lin Yukai portrays them. The workers echo Nan Ying's sentiments, questioning Lin Yotsai's intentions and what more he expects from them. Lin Yukai, feeling uneasy, realizes that his assumptions about Yi City were flawed. It still harbors individuals with power and resolve. Recognizing Nan Ying, Lin Yukai identifies him as the deserter featured in recent news reports, adding a layer of tension to the encounter. In a tense exchange, Lin Yukai accuses Nan Ying of refusing conscription and attacking a soldier, threatening to execute him on the spot. Unfazed, Nan Ying dismisses the threat but highlights the consequences, his role in processing tens of thousands of mutant beasts at the Trail Tower. He emphasizes that his demise would impede the supply progress even further. The revelation shocks both the veteran major and Lin Yukai. Nan Ying elaborates on the challenges posed by high-level mutant beasts, which affect human minds with their malignant energy, and explains why Lin Yukai sought assistance from East City. Despite his willingness to take on the task, Nan Ying acknowledges the officer's intent to eliminate him. Lin Yukai realizes that a deserter in East City possesses knowledge of mutant beasts, leading to a shift in the power dynamics. Observing the reactions of those present, Lin Yukai finds Nan Ying's claims credible and decides to go along with it. He expresses cautious optimism, hoping Nan Ying speaks the truth. Lin Yukai then pledges to send 5,000 level 4 mutant beasts to Yi City's trail grounds the following day, setting a week as the deadline for Nan Ying to process them. If successful, Nan Ying will be pardoned. Otherwise, Lin Yukai vows to settle all debts. With that, Lin Yukai departs, leaving the workers curious about Nan Ying's decision to accept the military pledge. Concerns arise about the consequences if Nan Ying fails. Xiao Lu questions Nan Ying's ability to handle the mutants alone prompting reassurance from Nan Ziying that he can manage the task. While acknowledging the challenges ahead, Nan Ziying contemplates the formidable nature of the fourth-level mutant beasts. These creatures possess formidable defenses and potent mental disruption capabilities, making them among the most challenging adversaries. However, Nan Ziying recognizes the value not only in their utility as supplies but also in their materials. Reflecting on Lin Yotsai's relentless pursuit of profit, Nan Ziying sees an opportunity amidst the adversity. These creatures serve as ideal subjects for enhancing Nan Ziying's azure talent. Nan Ziying devises a plan to first eliminate all the beasts provided by Lin Yukai, then leverage their essence to bolster his own abilities. Ultimately, Nan Ziying intends to eradicate Lin Yukai and his associates, severing their influence once and for all.